Welcome to Pacific Key here in Glasgow. This is the headquarters of the BBC in Scotland, and we're here for the last of our leader interviews. Now, the polls in Scotland show the Scottish National Party in a formidable position. With the strong possibility, the party could be playing a decisive role in the next Westminster Parliament. Tonight, I'm with the leader of the SNP, Nicola Sturgeon. Nicola Sturgeon, uh, your pitch this election is don't vote Labour in Scotland, vote SNP, uh, but probably vote Labour if you're in England. Can you explain that inconsistency? Well, I'll make it very simple. I don't want to see another Conservative government. Tory governments haven't been good for Scotland. I don't think they've been particularly good for the UK as a whole. So I'm saying very clearly that if there is an anti-Tory majority in the House of Commons after May the 7th, we should band together to stop David Cameron getting back into Downing Street. So that's the first thing I would say. But secondly, I then want the Tories to be replaced by something better, something bolder and something more progressive. And I, like many people across Scotland and the UK, still remember the last majority Labour government that was elected on a wave of hope and optimism and then introduced tuition fees, started privatising the health service and took us into an illegal war in Iraq. So I want a big team of SNP MPs in the House of Commons. They are first and foremost to make Scotland's voice heard more loudly than it's been heard before, to protect Scotland's interests, to stand up for Scotland at every opportunity. But secondly, to build progressive alliances so that we can get better politics at Westminster but, for everybody. But if you were in England, you would vote Labour? Uh, well, I, I would look at my candidate and I right. would decide what the most progressive candidate was but probably, and, and vote but for them. Well, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm yeah. not living in okay. England. I, I'm living in Scotland and so I'm not sure if I'm going to give you a headline here, but I'm <laughs> saying to people in Scotland, vote SNP. I'll be voting <laughs> right. SNP on right. May the 7th. Now, look, some of your supporters clearly think there's no difference, really, between Labour and the Conservatives. Not, not 100 metres from here, mm. there was a banner saying, Red Tory is out, referring to Labour. Everything you're saying, though, implies there's quite a big difference between Labour and the Conservatives well, because that's why you want to get the Conservatives out and Labour in. Well, again, I'll, I'll be quite straightforward about this. I, I don't think Ed Miliband and David Cameron are exactly the same. I think the Tories are, are bad for Scotland. That's why I don't want to see another Tory government. But equally, I don't think there's been a big enough difference between Labour right. and the Conservatives. I think very often, and this election is a, a case in point, very often in this campaign, instead of being a progressive voice, standing against continued cuts and continued austerity, we've got Ed Miliband seemingly at pains to tell people how tough he would be. You've got Labour politicians like Rachel Reeves promising to be tougher on welfare than the Tories. So I don't think there's been a big enough difference. And so it comes back to my fundamental point. I want to get the Tories out. I want to see the back of the Tories. But there's no point replacing them with Tory light. I want to see them replaced with something better and more progressive. Do you want to destroy Labour in Scotland? Would you be happy if they were wiped out? I want to win the election in Scotland, and that means beating Labour, because I think it's in Scotland's interest, for two reasons, to have a big team of SNP MPs. You know, Scotland has voted Labour in Westminster elections for all of my life. That hasn't protected us against the Tories, and even when there's been a Labour government, it's tended to be a Labour government that has been a tory light government. So I want Scotland's voice to be heard more loudly than it is usually heard at Westminster. But secondly, I want that voice then to be a voice for progressive right. politics. And the SNP okay, can make a big difference is, that at Westminster. Been, it's been very well put. Look, we can't get away from talking a bit about politics after the election. I, I could call this mm. deal or no deal. And you'll know <laughs> that Ed Miliband has said under no uh -huh. circumstances is he going to do a deal with you. I'm interested in whether you think... Well, whether you think his position is actually insulting to the Scottish voters if they do what we think they're going I, to do. I think much of what Westminster politicians right now are saying is in danger of being quite insulting to Scottish voters. You know, we all remember just a few months ago during the independence referendum, we had politicians like David Cameron and Ed Miliband, Nick Clegg, coming to Scotland and saying, please don't leave the UK. Scotland should lead the UK. Your voice is heard, your voice matters, you're a part of the family. Now it appears what they want to say to Scotland is that your voice will only be heard if you vote how we want you to vote. Mm. So if Scotland chooses to make its voice heard by voting SNP, that's perfectly legitimate. And then I think politicians across the UK have to respect the democratic wishes of, of Scotland. Mm, but I, I suspect what he's thinking is, if he says he's going to talk to you, he wouldn't use this word, that will be toxic with a lot of voters well, in I, I England. I think he should be a bit tougher and not be kicked around right. so much 
by the, by the Tories, I think he should be bolder in saying that he will respect the wishes of, of voters because there's a more fundamental point than just how people in Scotland vote. The polls are saying that neither Labour or the Tories are going to get a majority. Now, they can go through this election, and I understand this talking as if they are going to get a majority, but once the votes are cast, if those votes are such that neither of them get a majority, they'll have to reflect that opinion. And that means talking to others, it means compromising. I've, I was the deputy leader of a minority government for four years. At a very practical level, unless you're prepared to respect the wishes of the people who vote and talk to and compromise with other parties, you don't get your business well, through, and that's the reality. Let's talk a little about how the kind of government you're talking about can work uh, in Westminster. Um, let's start with the Queen's speech. Yeah. Let's suppose uh, there's a minority, mm -hmm. Labour minority, but they can form a government with your support. Mm -hmm. They put up a Queen's speech, a programme for government, it's crucial for the new government to pass that Queen's speech, isn't it? Would you vote with Ed Miliband, vote for that? I, I'm perhaps quite unusually in this election. I'm trying to be as straightforward yeah, with people no, as understand. possible. I'm, I'm not going to do anything that heralds in a Tory government. Right. So if but, you support... Look, let me put a really mm -hmm. specific qu okay. question. If you supported 90%, but you didn't support 10% of the Queen's speech, which is perfectly well, possible. I'm, I'm, Would you vote with it or I'm not? not? I'm You're not going to have it going to be one or the other, isn't it? I'm not going to do anything that sees a, a Tory government be likely. But this is not all about a Queen's speech. Because no, 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 but let's, let's, do, let's come on to the, okay. the, the, the post-Queen's speech. But just on the Queen's speech, if you supported 50% of it and you didn't like the but other 50%, I would think you vote get, for it? We're getting into hypothetical territory here. And with the oh, greatest... but you've been great at talking well, about the hypothetical. I, I, it's all, well, it's all actually, really Actually, unlike other leaders, I'm trying to be yeah, honest. Know, but there comes, a point, where you, there comes a point where you have to let people vote. Now, what I've said, and I'm saying it very, very clearly, and I think people can you know, get a sense exactly what I mean here, I'm not going to do anything that would put, in the days after May the 7th, a Tory government into right. office. In fact, I've gone right. to the opposite extreme then and say we should lock out a Tory government. But the point I'm making, and again, I, I bring to this a lot of experience of minority government. The point is, the Queen's speech is, is one vote in yeah. the House of Commons. How you exert influence over the lifetime of a parliament, particularly with the Fixed Term Parliaments Act, is far more important. So I would seek to use the influence of the SNP, if Scotland gives us that influence, to effect change over the lifetime right. of the parliament. I want to That's come on to the life it. after the Queen's speech, but it seems to me, if you don't put the Tories in, you have to vote for the Queen's speech that Ed Miliband Look, puts up, whether you agree with 1%, 50% or 100%. And, just, and then the 1% or 10% Because otherwise you're risking the Tories getting in. whatever percent right. it is that I don't agree right. with, I will then seek to change right. the Labour so government's you, mind on that over the life right. of the parliament. So you vote That's for the Queen's we, speech? Well, what I'm saying is I will not put a Tory government right. into office in those days, but that's not to say we sign up to everything a Labour government wants to do. Right. We use our influence over the life of the Parliament to bring about the progressive right. change that we want. Vote by vote, you say, that we agree well, with I've, this, we don't agree with that. I, now, I've, that's, said, yeah. I've not ruled anything out here. Yeah. I've always said a coalition with Labour is highly unlikely. Ed Miliband mm. has since said the same because he's you know, been sort of bullied by the Tories to rule these things out. I've not ruled out confidence and supply. I think what is he most has, likely... Yeah. Well, yeah, well, I think what he says the morning after the election will probably be different to what he says now. He's misleading think, us? He's, no, he's, well, you know, he's in an election campaign. He's trying to you know, cling to the pretense that he's going to get majority. Everybody else knows that's not looking likely. But what I'm saying is I think a vote-by-vote -vote, uh, arrangement is both most likely and probably the way right. in which a big team of SNP MPs can wield maximum influence for Scotland's uh, benefit. Now, that's where we get to what some have said looks a bit like chaos. You have some experience of running well, I, minority I, I, governments. And it was, and, and it yep. was stable. Can we, it can was we, successful. It was effective. It actually we, led to that point, minority government focus? becoming a majority. Can we focus on this? Because there are three worries that I've, that I've heard expressed. They all begin with the letter P, as it happens. <laughs> um, one is pork barrel politics, which means because you have a decisive vote on every vote, you can just get... You can say, oh, we want a bridge over here, pay for that, or we don't vote Well, actually, we're you. building a, a brand-new bridge uh, over the fourth Indeed, in Scotland right now, paid for by the Scottish fantastic. Government, so we don't need uh, a new bridge in that. Look, I... But, but, but so you can, you can rule out... You, you will uh, give, look, us your, not... your, give the UK your pledge that there will look, be I've, none I've been... of that sectional sort of interest. Yeah, pursuit. I think I can. I've been yeah. at pains during this campaign to say to people outside of Scotland... Now, people outside of Scotland can't vote for my party, no. but it's still important to me to say to people outside of Scotland that if the SNP is given influence by the Scottish electorate in the House of Commons, we will seek to exercise that influence positively and constructively. Right. And do you know why? 
because it matters to Scotland and to people in Scotland for as long as we're part of the Westminster system that we get good decisions coming out of Westminster because those decisions that are taken at Westminster affect the lives of people in Scotland just as they affect the lives of people in other parts of the UK. So I've held out and I continue to hold out the hand of friendship right. and there are people of progressive opinion in every corner of the UK that I think would probably listen to some of what the SNP is saying in this election and say, do you know what, we could do with a bit of that in Westminster politics. OK, so no pork barrel politics, no sectional sort of interests. Um, the second P is paralysis, that you could have a government, for example, that can't get a budget through but isn't voted out of office, so we're not going to mm -hmm. a new election, and we're kind of stuck with a stasis or a stalemate. Um, how worried should we be well, be again, this, this is where I, I bring to bear experience of being the Deputy First Minister in a minority government in the Scottish Parliament for four years. Now, we had to build alliances for our budgets, for our legislation and for our policies. And what you've just described to me there in terms of paralysis didn't happen right. because we worked to build those majorities. And minority government, and I always feel the need to kind of preface this statement by saying I do prefer being a majority government, <laughs> but nevertheless, minority government had very good aspects to it because it meant, and it will mean for Westminster... Kept you on your toes, keep, I bet. Keeps you yeah. on your toes, yeah. and it means you have to win arguments. You can't just push well, things look, through on the this, strength of this the This comes numbers. to the third P, though, which I call pandemonium. I'm, I'm, I'm on tenter here. Pand to see pandemonium. The, the pandemonium is. is the third P. That they, it's just another word for chaos that begins with P. And now, you were in, you had a minority government, mm. but let's take some examples of what happened under that minority government. Your budget in 2009 didn't pass. Once, the Greens didn't. In four the Greens years, didn't. And the Greens didn't pass later. it. So then you had to bunk some money at Labour, who then changed their mind but, and who uh, and who didn't. You're pass making it. my point now, for is me. Is that an advert for minority government, or is that an advert for no, majority government? Well, I, I think it's an advert for a government respecting the fact that it was a minority and it had to work with others to get its budget through. So on one occasion out of the four years we were a minority a budget government, not passing. we didn't pass. A week later it did pass because well, we went away. Go. The next couple worked. of years Alex Salmond had to suspect, threaten he'd resign. He was like, I think that was the year before actually. You, you passed this or we're out. I, mean, <laughs> I, I think that was the year before, okay, but anyway, <laughs> by the by. Look, I think the, the budgets we passed and the policies we passed tended to be better Better, and better, better minority budgets. government than majority well, I, government. I said earlier on I prefer majority yeah, government. What I, the, the point I'm trying to make here is, and we've got experience of this in Scotland, is major, minority government needn't be chaotic. It needn't lead to pandemonium, to go back to your <laughs> use of, of uh, words beginning with the letter P. It needn't be unstable. The contrary can be true. And now, if the minority government that I was deputy leader of hadn't been a success, then at the election that followed that, presumably the SNP wouldn't then have been turned into a majority government by the Scottish voters. So let's embrace, if, if okay. this is what the voters that's across what the UK decide, we've it. all got a responsibility to make it work. And I'm saying I will play my part as leader of the SNP in making sure the SNP is seeking to make it work in the interests of people in Scotland and in the interests of people okay. across the UK. You've made a lot of the fact that the the biggest party in the Westminster Parliament doesn't have a moral right to govern. It's whoever can muster the most votes, basically. You may be the second party, but with another party, muster more votes. Do you, is, that, is that the same as the position you took when you were in minority? Because when you became the minority party, and you were the biggest mm. party, I think Alex Salmond, who was leading you, said it's very clear Labour's lost this election and no longer has any moral authority to govern Scotland. Well, but if Labour and the Tories or the Liberal Democrats had chosen to come together, they would have been able to keep the SNP out right. of office they, in Right, and that would have been fine with you? Because it, it sure. sounds from what Alex Salmond Look, was saying, that there was a sort of to be, moral argument about who should govern. To be frank about it, I'm, I'm sure the SNP would have uh, moaned and groaned about that right. had it been the case, as I'm sure the Tories will if they are the largest party but end up not being in government. But the point I'm making is a, a fundamental point of, I was going to say principle, it's actually a fundamental point of arithmetic. If the Tories can't win a majority, and there is a majority of people who don't want to see a, a Tory government, then if, and it's an if, because Ed Miliband has so far given the impression that in those circumstances he'd rather see David Cameron in office than work with the SNP, and I hope I'm wrong about that, but if we were to choose to work together, then we could lock David Cameron out of Downing Street. And I'm saying I'd be willing to work with Ed Miliband in order to bring about mm -hmm. that end. We actually commissioned a poll it actually shows that most people, 55% on our poll, do think the leader of the biggest party should be the, the Prime Minister. Well, what I'm saying is if the Tories can't win... I mean, it comes down to, to arithmetic. You know, the Tories have been in government now for five years. They're going to uh, the, the electorate, yeah, yeah. coalition government. If they can't win a majority, then they have no right to have 
a majority created for them. Now, if they can't win a majority on their own and they can't put together a majority from other parties, then why do they have some kind of right to continue okay. in government if there is a majority that, if it came together, said we want to put together an alternative right. government? That's the way So you don't recognise the moral right to govern because you're the largest party, and that, that's, that's been very clearly put. Look, I want to talk about some other scenarios, some other issues around the post-election mm. uh, politics. I just want to understand exactly how your MPs will vote on what one might call English issues mm -hmm. or English and Welsh issues, issues which have been devolved to the Scottish Parliament for Scotland but which have not been mm -hmm. uh, devolved or left in Westminster for England. How will your MPs vote? Well, if there are issues that are genuinely English only issues that have no impact in Scotland. I, I've said repeatedly yeah. I think there is a strong case for Scottish MPs not voting in those issues. I think the problem is A strong case into, or not? Because that's the you know, I, I, The SNP wouldn't vote. They wouldn't oh. vote. If, if issues are genuinely English only. Right. I can think I they test though a few? Because well, that's can where I, I think the there's. Point? A, okay, fin can I finish okay. the point? And Just then, to, then you can test me. Okay, we'll hear the um, Google room and then. But, because I think in this debate, the, the difficulty we often get into is that issues are characterised as English only issues when in fact they're anything but. So matters relating to the English Health Service. Votes on the English Health Service that have budgetary implications right. have a direct knock-on effect to the budget of the Scottish Government. In those circumstances, okay. it's not only right that Scottish well, look, let's have Let's, let's hear the principle, because it's hard in abstract, mm -hmm. isn't it? Let's, okay. So, if there was an English bill for putting mushy peas into school dinners on a Friday, that would be an English issue if, and if you it wouldn't vote on it. If it didn't affect the school's budget that then had a knock-on effect through right. the Barnet formula to the Scottish budget, then I, I would be happy to not vote right. on the mushy okay. peas issue. Speed limit, the English speed limit. I, that, we wouldn't vote, we wouldn't on, vote that, on that. No. What about bus regulation or competition between bus companies? Is that something Again, that would affect you? I think the devil is often... It sounds to me as if that would be something that wouldn't because that's a matter devolved to the Scottish Parliament. If we can simplify this, the, the, the key issue is, is there a budgetary link? Because as you know very well, the Scottish Government is funded through the Barnet formula right. so that changes to spending on health, on education, on other matters that are devolved to the Scottish Parliament in England affect our budget. So if there is a budgetary link or if there's something that has a direct right. implication for Scottish interests, we'd vote. If there wasn't, we wouldn't. So the, a, a bigger one, perhaps, university fees, the university fee regime. The, well, I've said You'll that, vote on that we would vote on that for, principally for the reason I've, I've given right. because And you'd vote on that even if, for example, there was a Conservative majority in England that wasn't supporting a change, you would... But we'd let, only, let a, an Ed Miliband Labour government overturn the English majority we'd only and change the regime. But, it, but on the basis that it would have a direct knock-on effect just on Scotland's the, budget. But we would only prevail does that seem on reasonable? any... Does it seem reasonable? Well, I mean, it's obviously it does have some effect, but it, let's face it, it's a rather second-order effect on Scotland compared to the effect well, can I, on England, isn't it? Let me it? finish that point and then perhaps make a bigger point. I mean, on that, we would only prevail on any of these issues if there was a majority in the House of Commons to get yeah, that Yeah, but there wouldn't be an so English majority. That's where be, I'm, I'm putting well, it to you. you there wouldn't what? be an I English spent, majority. I've spent all of my adult life, and in particular the last couple of years, arguing for Scotland to be independent. Yeah. But Scotland chose not to be independent, and people who argued against it, particularly people from Westminster, made this great play of, of the UK being a family of nations and Scotland, England, Northern Ireland and Wales not standing on their own. You can't turn around now and after Scotland voted to remain part of that and say, ah, but well, we've got to allow let me, let me England explain, and let me Scotland explain, to, what, to stand on, on their own. What, what, the, one difference. So Liberal MPs, Labour MPs in Scotland, a part of a party mm -hmm. whose objective is the maximisation of welfare for the UK. Your party constitution's a bit different, isn't it? Your party constitution, which I have had a look at, mm -hmm. not the whole lot. You've probably had a look at it more recently than I have. Paragraph 2B, <laughs> our well aim, it's 2A is independence for Scotland, 2B, the furtherance of all Scottish interests. Yeah. It doesn't say the furtherance of English interests or Welsh yeah, interests or Northern Irish interests, it's the furtherance but of can Scottish I, can I make interests. A point? And, I, and you would be voting this, on English issues, this is primarily a, English issues. This is, a, I think, a really legitimate thing to push me on, if, yeah, if I may well, say so. Uh, and I, I, want to, I want to try because it really does matter to me that people outside of Scotland understand this. I don't see Scottish interests in, in a narrow parochial sense, but also Scottish interests are served if decisions taken at Westminster are better decisions. And that doesn't mean just better decisions. But who is to say decisions. that you should be well, the judge I, of the English interest? It may be that you have a very good and informed opinion on I, what the English I, should be doing. The SNP is, the is one say, voice. Now, but we, the English we'll should only, surely be the main voice on those English issues once they've been devolved we'll to only, Scotland. We'll only 
prevail on these issues if there is a majority across the House of Commons. It's not that no. we will say we you want this see, and it automatically You don't happens. see any problem about Scottish I, I MPs see, whose constitution is the furtherance only of Scottish interests and not of English interests voting inconsistencies. on English issues. I, I see a number of inconsistencies right. and imperfections in the in UK and the, the Westminster yeah, system. Yeah. And that's why I argued for Scotland to be independent. But Scotland chose not to be. We're part of the Westminster system. And the point I'm making is that you know, yes, I will always stand up for Scottish interests, but I actually think some of the things we'll be arguing for, like an alternative to austerity politics and better protection for public services and action to get our economy growing, I think on these we'll be able to make common cause with people in other parts of the UK. We'll be one voice. I hope we'll be a powerful voice in the House of Commons. That's down to how people in Scotland vote, but we will exercise that influence responsibly. And we, when I launched our manifesto last week, I said very clearly that we will have in mind when we're taking decisions in the House of Commons, the Scottish interests, of course, but we will have in mind as well the wider interests of people right. across the UK. And I mean, I mean a, that sincerely. No, no, and a, a lot of English though, a lot of English people will listen to that and may think we don't want Nicola Sturgeon to be the judge of the English national interest or the Welsh national interest. And if we don't want any, her to play any part in this, we better vote Conservative. Won't they take that? Won't they reach that conclusion from what you're saying? Well, I, I don't think that is what everybody in you know. I'm not trying to second guess or say that I you know either that there is one single English opinion on that or that I know what it is. But I know some of the response and feedback and communications I've had from voters in England over the past few weeks, you know, throughout the election campaign, and it's anecdotal, I don't pretend mm -hmm. otherwise, has been actually, do you know what, we wish we were hearing some of what we're hearing from the SNP from parties in England. We wish we had a party like the SNP to vote for. Now, if it was the case that either Labour or the Tories was speaking for English opinion, if there is a homogenous English opinion, then what are other of them would be miles ahead in the opinion polls right now? The fact that they're not suggests okay. to me there's actually quite a strong appetite for change in England, just as there is in Scotland. Now, I don't pretend to speak for England. No, well, because you haven't got a seat. Because so I can't, obviously, but what I can say sincerely is that I'm not blind and, and wouldn't want to ignore the interests of people right across the UK when we're taking decisions you, in the House of Commons. Do you see a danger of nationalism? Um, growing across the nations of the uh, of the UK. Obviously, it's been ignited in Scotland after the referendum. Well, I, do, you, do you find it, for example, dangerous that it may be as building up in England? And some of these I, arguments are becoming I, much more fraught. I'm sceptical about mm. whether it, it. I mean, I've got family in England. Yeah. My granny was English, so while I'm I'm not living in England, I'm not English. You know, I've got some insight into. I I, I think David Cameron is playing a pretty tawdry game around what he's trying. So he to do. shouldn't play up English but nationalism, but it's it's okay for the well, Scottish in, in, to have nationalism. It's up to him to do. What I'm saying I think he's playing a. He, but he professes to be a supporter right, of the right, union right. in the UK. I, I make no pretense about right. the fact I support Scottish independence. He professes to be a unionist, and yet he's playing this rather uh, tawdry game. I think the point I was going to make though is I'm not sure it will be successful because I don't believe. While I'm sure there's lots of people in England don't like what the SNP stands for and don't you know like me or or like anything about us, I think there's also a lot of people in England too. They're not scared, and I hope nobody's scared of, of the SNP, whether they agree with us or not. But there'll be a lot of people in England who actually wish there was a bit more of the kind of passionate progressive politics that we're advocating in the political mm. debate in England as well. Who, if um, England are playing Germany out of interest in football, I'm who not do a you big support? football fan, but uh, I'd, I'd be quite happy for England. To, I'm not a big football fan. No, no, I, know, I support but... Scotland, I support Air United, but I have no issue with England doing well at football or at any sport. England, Germany, you would be. I think down. I'd probably support England. Yeah. And what about England, Wales? <laughs> that may be more. I don't know. Look, I, Come you're, on. You're, unlike David Cameron, I'm not about to pretend that I know something about football <laughs> no, and then you know be which caught country out you support. on it. Come on, you know which country you support. I support Scotland at football. England, Wales, I, I don't know. I guess it would. With me, and I'm, yeah. this is, you know, maybe a bit of a. Mm. I'm, I'm getting into really difficult territory. Maybe this is a bit of a woman thing. Probably depend on what players were playing yeah. and who I liked best uh, okay, on the field a, at the that's time. That's a cop out, and you know it. Uh, <laughs> I was look. also a big David Beckham fan. I'm still a big <laughs> David Beckham fan. <laughs> One former leader of yours, uh, Gordon Wilson, referred, I think, to the Southern Cancer. He was talking about, I think, the domination of London and the South of England in, in, in UK politics, and something about the ethos. I think the the individualistic ethos. Would you use that phrase? Absolutely no. I mean, Gordon Wilson is a much loved former leader of my party, but you know, on that and on some other things, I, I don't agree with him, and it's not language I would ever use. Do you, do you see London, though, or London in the South, as a, 
I'm going to mix some horrible, horribly mixed metaphors. Is <laughs> a golden goose laying eggs for the nation as a wealth generator, I, or as a vampire sucking out? It, of the neither of those country. things. Actually, for, firstly, I love London as a city. Yeah. It's one of my favourite cities in the world. I think it's a hugely vibrant, multicultural, dynamic city. Um, I think it's hugely economically successful, and that, on one level, is good for the entirety of the UK. But I think the UK economy has become too imbalanced in favour of London and South East. I think we need to rebalance it a bit so that some of those economic benefits are more spread across the country. But that's not an anti-London statement no. in any sense. I think in any country you want economic growth and the benefits of economic growth to be more evenly spread, not just geographically, but across the uh, different uh, sections of society as well. Who do you think is closer to the people of the northeast of England? Who's better to look after them? The <laughs> SNP... Or the Westminster, the Westminster establishment. I think that's something you'd have to ask them. What I do know is that I mean, my gran was from uh, just outside Sunderland in the north of England, so I've you know I've got a particular affinity, personal affinity to that part of England, and. Um, I know that I would want Scotland, we do, we've got a borderlands initiative just now between the south of Scotland and the north of England. I think there's a huge scope to, to strengthen the links between Scotland and the north of England. One of the things we've got you know, a common interest in arguing for is for something like high speed rail to you know, start north as well as south and work its way down. So I think there's huge links we can build there, but the north of England, I'm sure they would say they're, they're English. and. It's not for me to say there should be greater devolution, but, you know, I think there is an argument for it. It's not for me to decide that. But I would always want Scotland, even if Scotland had voted yes last year and we were on the way to becoming independent, for me that was never about cutting links, social and uh, cultural and family links between Scotland and the rest of the UK. It was just Scotland mm -hmm. taking political and economic responsibility. All right. Look, we're getting... We're almost out of time. Looking at where you are now... You're not actually running for the Westminster Parliament. You're the First Minister of Scotland. Are you the most powerful woman in, in the UK at the moment? No, I, I, you know, I, no. Who is more powerful um, than you? No, I don't. I, I always find these questions just a little bit point. No disrespect to anything. I just find them a little bit pointless. These things are subjective. They depend on your perspective. I'm the First Minister of Scotland. That is by far my most important responsibility and it's a job I will always do to the best of my abilities. Scotland remains part of the Westminster system. so. As leader of the SNP and as First Minister of Scotland, I want Scotland to have greater clout and influence in the Westminster system so that we get better decisions. And if it does, you'll be, you will be calling a lot of the shots, won't you? Well, you can, that's very pejorative language. I'll be looking no. to work with others to build alliances for progressive change. You know, you can, and it strikes me in this debate, and I can understand why some people want to do this, you, you can characterise it as somebody being in somebody else's pocket or vice versa, or <laughs> pulling somebody's strings or calling the shots. Do you know what? Maybe it's time across the UK for a different style of politics where we get away from the kind of partisan bickering and say the electorate hasn't given any one of us a majority. We're going to have to work together. And that's what I want the SNP to play our part in doing. If at the end of your career, and sorry, I've gone flying, you're near the end of your career, you've got decades to go, decades to go. If at the end of your career you'd achieved keeping the Tories out of office, you'd achieved lots of things, but you hadn't achieved independence for Scotland. Would you look back on your career as a success or a failure? I, I'm not sure. I'd, I'd be disappointed that we hadn't done what I think is right for Scotland, but I'll be also philosophical about that because it's, it's a decision for the Scottish people. Scotland will become independent if and only if a majority of people in Scotland decide that's the right future for our country. I think one day we will, but that's up to the people of Scotland. What I'll continue to do each day of my career for however long it, it remains uh, to be had I've just worked for the best deal for Scotland the best interest of Scotland and as long as we're part of the UK I've tried to build alliances with others in the UK to get a better deal for all of us that's my simple approach to politics and you know if I do my best every day I'm in office then hopefully one day many years from now I'll look back and say whatever the eventual outcome I, I did my best and I think at the end of the day that's all a politician can do. Nicola Sturgeon thank you very much thank indeed. You.